I read eight books in March from the same exact author. So stick around. I am going to share with you all 21 books that I read in March, as well as the ratings that I gave them and whether or not I'd recommend for you to read them. <laughs> Hi everyone, I'm Lisa, the cozy mystery author who writes mysteries with kitty cats in them. On this channel, we're gonna talk all about cozy mysteries and I guess just mysteries in general, books, movies, TV shows, and probably a couple kitty cat videos. So if this sounds like you or something you might be interested in, make sure to hit the subscribe button below. I post new videos every week. So today we're gonna go over my read list, all the books that I read in March. I made it through 21 books, mostly because I have switched to audiobooks, which has helped significantly. And it has like tripled, quadrupled, quintupled, I don't know. It is like astronomically increased the number of books that I can read. I used to watch TV shows a lot, but with all of the delays in TV shows because of filming, because of COVID, there really aren't as many TV shows to watch. And I do love TV. I'm not one of those people who are like, shame on you for watching TV or wasting time. I enjoy TV. I get a lot of ideas from there and it actually inspires me and helps me to write more books. So I don't feel bad about it. I don't think you should feel bad about watching TV either because it takes up a lot of time. Anyways, here's what you need to do. The first thing you should do is friend me on Goodreads because I'm always on the lookout for new book recommendations. And if you are too, you can keep up with me throughout the month and see what I'm reading. The first eight books that I read are from the same author, which is Gina Lamana. So four of them are the first four books in the Hex Files, and the other four are the first four books in the Kate uh, Rossetti mystery novels. And they both have dual POV, which is a little different for me because I'm used to reading first person POV when it comes to cozy mysteries. So I would say these are a little more edgier, so, but like not hardcore thrillers or anything. Uh, so I call these more like just straight up mysteries. So the Hex Files are paranormal mysteries. I think she did a really great job. I mean, I'm not all the way through of like tying these all together, all seven books in the series. And so the first four are all focused on her and her vampire. So it's kind of like Twilight, uh, but without like the wimpy heroine character. Like this character is a witch. It's Danny DeMarco and she works for the NYPD, but it's a special division of the NYPD called the Sixth Borough, which is wicked, where all the supernaturals live. I think supernaturals can live anywhere, but they're mostly concentrated in this borough and they have their own special police force of which she is a detective but she is someone special because she's the only one that can see residuals which means she can see like leftover magic where it kind of glows and she can tell what spells were cast or what uh, counter spells or antidotes or things like that and so there are only a few people who can do that uh, and the ones that can aren't always suitable for being police officers. So she's like one of very few that have this special gift. And because of that, they she kind of just floats from case to case. Now, her boyfriend is a vampire. It's Matthew. And he is a captain on the police force. And then her other love interest is Gray. And he is an elder wolf, uh, which I guess is a special wolf because the wolves in this book, when they turn at, I guess, moonlight on a full moon they just become like wild animals but when he turns he like is in full control and he can do it whenever he wants and so werewolves in this story cannot turn uh unless it's a full moon and if they do turn when it's not a full moon it takes a lot of energy and it only lasts for a few minutes so this is i think the extent of the magic that i've really learned in this world um it's not like crazy magic most things are spells and you have to be a witch and have some magic and you can have potions and things like that uh but this is her just going around solving mysteries. And then like once you get into like book four, then we really start getting into the Hex Files, which is this whole uh, sort of mystery un unto itself where everyone is trying to stop the people that are named in the Hex Files and stop them from... Um, saving the world. So if the person, it's like a curse. So whoever has all of the hex files can then curse the whole magical world. And only the people that are named in the hex files are able to be like the antidote to stop the curse. So I think we're going to get into that like for the rest of the series and five, six, and seven, there's only three more books left, but gave them all a five star. I love them. The characters were amazing. Her furniture talks to her and all of the furniture has this cute personality. And I would hundred percent, if you could listen to this on audiobook because I tried reading it and it wasn't as good when I read it, but when I listened on audiobook, it was amazing. 
Allison Ryan is the narrator. She's an actress and she's super talented because every single voice inside of here, whether it was a man or it was a piece of furniture, sounded like a totally different person. Like I was completely blown away that it was just her doing the whole narration. Like I totally thought it was somebody else. And she switches like on a dime, like in two seconds. So I loved it. Even when she says she said, she like changed her voice for just those parts. So it was probably like one of the best narrations I've ever listened to. Um, the other four books were from the Detective Rossetti series. Now this one has no magical elements. She is a, like, it's not Minneapolis. I think it's right outside of Minneapolis. She is a detective and her, she also has a love triangle going on here. So it's an FBI agent and then a billionaire. Uh, so in the story, she meets the FBI agent in the first book, and then each book she solves a different mystery. So there's not any like overall arching sort of theme like there is in the Hex Files, but that's fine. And they're a little, um, I should say they're a lot grittier, uh, the murders in here. So she said her favorite author was Kendra Elliott, and that's who she modeled these after. So I liked all of these books. I gave them all a five. Uh, and I believe there are only four out right now. She usually writes six or seven in her series, so I suspect that she'll write at least two more. And then the what was I going to say? Oh, so Kendra Elliott. So I was like, okay, well, she basically saw Kendra Elliott's and these are so amazing. I will read a Kendra Elliott book. Last Sister. So The Last Sister is, I gave this book a one star. I didn't even finish it. Like, I think I made it 70% through. And then I honestly just skipped to the end and read the last chapter to figure out what happened. And so I didn't really like it. So it's basically about a murder suicide between a husband and wife that happens in the backyard. And when they say the last sister, it's because there are, are three sisters that were inside the, that are, I guess, inside the house at the time of the murder. And so they're just trying to figure out who did it. And it didn't really make a lot of sense. And it was kind of boring and it jumped all over the place. And so that's why for me, it was a one star. Um, but let's move on to the rest of the list. So another thriller I read was Abandoned by Alison Brennan. So this one I gave three stars only because, um, and I love Alison Brennan. She's one of my favorite authors, but this was about a girl who, you know, had a teenage mom. She drops her off with her grandparents. They're rich, but the teenage, you know, teen mom runs off with her boyfriend and then disappears. So years later, I think like 13 years after she disappears, it, her daughter is now a reporter. I think because her mom was sending home postcards like once every year or something. And so the postcard stopped at one point. So she figured she was dead and she had stopped taking money out of her um, trust fund. And so she is trying to figure out who killed her. But you don't really I mean, I don't want to ruin it for you, but it didn't have like a like a solution at the end where you're like, OK, I figured it out. I understand why. At the end, you still don't understand. And I don't know if that's because she wants you to keep reading within the series. I'm not really sure, but um, yeah. So that's why I gave that one a three star. Uh, I also read some true crime this month. So I read James Patterson's Till Murder Do Us Part. And uh, so one of the stories, so it had two stories in there and I believe they're on the investigation uh, discovery channel, the ID channel on TV, which I actually haven't seen them, but he does a really good job with these retail. Like you're totally into the story, right? So basically the first one is about a San Diego skateboarder. This is like back in the early 90s, like 880s when skateboarders used to use those pools uh, like empty pools and use those as ramps. And so this guy was like a superstar skateboarder and he had this girlfriend and she was a model and they were like really popular. Uh, and then street skateboarding took over. I'm not a skate, I'm not into skateboarding. I have no idea what it is. But that whole like professional skateboarding thing like just went away and people just do stuff on curbs and stairs and railings, I guess. I don't know, kind of like parkour. And that's like the cool thing now. So that he like kind of was a has-been then at that point. And so anyways, he like discovers God and then um, there's like a murder rape later <laughs> of one of her friends. So they're trying to figure it out. Anyways, it's a true crime. So obviously they figure it out at the end. And then the second one is uh, a guy who fakes his own death. And he has like two children from one marriage. He has a baby in a second marriage. He fakes his death, runs off, and then finds this other woman. And he tells her these crazy stories. Now, just to be fair, because the whole time you're thinking like, who would ever believe this? And this is the 1980s. And she just seemed like a really nice person, I guess. But he was like, I am an ex-CIA operative. And 
I used to have to kill. Like he said, he basically used the plot from Jason Bourne to be his backup story, even though he like was just this random guy in the suburbs that just wanted to fake his own death and like leave his wife and not have to pay child support. So anyway, so that was interesting how they finally found him. And this woman is like... I was afraid of him. So that was, I give that a five star. It was a really good retelling for true crime, although I do love true crime. Uh, so I also read a psychological thriller, The Wise by Taryn Fisher, and I gave this three stars because it was really good. Like it like kept you raptured and like totally interested in the beginning because the main character they talk about, because obviously there's three wives, right? She talks about her husband and how, you know, she fell in love with them, but he was already married, but he needed to have, he wanted a baby. And then, um, so she gets pregnant, but then she has a miscarriage and then she has a hysterectomy. So she can't have babies anymore. So then he goes on to find a third wife who can have a baby, um, but he keeps, you know, all of the wives on rotation because he's supposedly Mormon uh, and, you know, Mormons have polygamy. So, but he doesn't want them all. I think with, I, I shouldn't say anything. I don't know anything about polygamy, like in Mormons, but I believe they're all a family and they are friendly and kind of like one big unit. But he said he wanted to keep everyone separate. So she's like dying to find out about the other wives. Um, and so the book is all about her learning about them and it has like a crazy twist ending. So that uh that was a that was a book that I read. I guess maybe I'm not into psychological thrills because it wasn't bad, but it wasn't like, oh my god, it was the greatest ending ever. Uh so yeah. <laughs> That's that's probably the last psychological thriller I'll read. Uh, what else did I read? Oh, Adele Abbott's Murder on a Cat on a Count. It is a cat royal novel. Now, I normally love Adele Abbott. She's hilarious. She's funny. She has really good books. The only problem with this, and I gave it two stars, is because um, the main character was just kind of like very lackadaisical, didn't really care. And now that I think about it and look back on it. That's kind of like how all of her main characters are. So I can't really complain. But for some reason, this character was just kind of like, okay, I guess I'll do my job at this detective agency. And this is all based over in England. Uh, and then the next day when her boss dies, she's like, okay, well, I guess I will take the day off. And then her, her, the boss's daughter is like, you can have the business. And so she's like, okay, well, I guess I'll take over the business. Okay, I can do that. And like, even her neighbor took over this dog uh, from this supposedly her neighbor's homeless. So he pretends to be homeless, but he's not homeless. He just does it to make money, even though he's super rich and wealthy. Um, and so he has this dog. And after he dies, there's no one to take care of the dog, even though he's wealthy. It didn't really make a lot of sense. So the neighbor takes the dog in and she tells her, like, you need to start taking the dog out because I can't go up and down stairs. And she's like, oh, okay, I guess I'll take care of the dog. Like the whole time, it's just kind of like people tell her what to do and she kind of does it. It's just, it was very odd. So that's kind of why I gave it a low rating. Uh, the other one was The uh, Poppy Fields Guide to Abduction by Julie Mulhern. Now I give this one star. I, it was just, it didn't make any sense. Like, so the main character is this vapid celebrity and she has tons of money and she wakes up next to a dead body, right? So no spoiler, it's like happens in the first chapter. And so she runs off to Cabo uh, to escape or to hang out or I don't know, on vacation. And I've never been to Cabo. That seems to be like the popular Mexico vacation spot for everyone here on the West Coast. Uh, but anyways, so she goes to Cabo and then while she's there, like there's some more murders, like eight more murders or seven more murders. And so they take her passport and they tell her she has to say, and yeah, it was just like, it didn't really make a lot of sense. And it didn't kind of flow and, and she wasn't really a likable character because she was just like this rich kind of like superficial person, I guess. I don't know. I just couldn't get into it. Um, the next book I read was Janet Ivanovich's Tw Twisted 26, which I thought I had read before, but I I think I had checked it out from the library. But then, you know how you get busy and then the, the library loan had ended. So I was reading it and I was like, this looks familiar. And then I had only read like the first chapter before. But I gave that five stars. This is the one where Grandma Mazur has, a, uh, has gotten married in Vegas. He dies like the very next day and everyone is on the hunt for her because they think she has these special keys because he worked for the mafia and he used to hold on to um, 
to, I don't know if it's evidence that he was holding on to or something special or a bunch of money, but it turns out that he is dirt poor and he spent all his money. So there's no money at all. Um, but everyone thinks there's like some special money going on somewhere. So it was your typical like Janet Ivanovich, Stephanie Plum novel, which was fun to read. Uh, the other book that I read was a, I want to say it's a romance, but it was more like chiclet. It's called Playing with Matches by Hannah Orenstein. And I gave this three stars because it was interesting, but it did not have a happily ever after in case you're wondering. It's about this 21 year old. She graduates. She can't find a job. She runs into this random person who's like, you can be a matchmaker. And she's like, um, okay, I guess I'll be a matchmaker. And so she becomes a matchmaker. She really doesn't know how to do it. She's running around just talking to random people being like, I bet I could set you up with somebody. And then she meets somebody else. And she's like, I bet I could set you up with somebody. And so this goes on for a while. Her boyfriend in the meantime is like this really self-involved narcissistic guy who works for Wall Street. So it was a little, I don't know, whenever books are based in New York City, I am a tough audience because I lived there for a decade. And so whenever people have stereotypes, I'm like, that's really not how people are, especially because I don't want to say I worked on Wall Street, but I worked at a securities uh, trading firm. So there were a lot of traders there. So, I mean, in theory, we were on Wall Street, but because of after 9-11, everyone moved to Midtown. So, um... What was my point? Oh, so anyway, so he's very stereotypical and like there was nothing special about him. And so without any spoiler alerts, just so you know, like he cheats on her and then she does find love with the new person, but it totally has like the worst ending ever. So if you're looking for a happily ever after romance novel, this is not it. She also doesn't learn anything from it. So sometimes with chiclet novels, like you learn something from it or something comes out of it. That didn't that didn't really happen here. So um, but it was interesting. It was cute to read. Um, so I give it three stars. Uh, the next one up is Sherry Thomas's A Study in Scarlet Women. This was amazing. I gave this five stars. I am not into historical novels um, or Sherlock Holmes retellings at all, but I'd heard so many good things about this book, so I wanted to check it out. So basically the main character's name is Charlotte Holmes, and it's during Regency, um, you know, England. So if you had seen uh, any or read any Regency books, you know that it's really important back in the 1790s for women to get married and to, or is it the 1890s? Maybe it's the 1890s for them to get married and for them to, you know, find a proper husband and they have the season and you have to be part of the London ton to be invited to the season. So anyways, she comes from a super wealthy family and she has decided though that this is not for her. She doesn't want an arranged marriage. She doesn't want any of it. She just wants to live her own life. So she like has some money saved up and she just goes to London to live on her own. So her father just, ignores her and is like, you know, we'll just let her, you know, do whatever. Um, and so what she does, though, to make sure she is totally unmarriageable is, or mar un unengageable, whatever it is, she's no longer, you know, prime wedding material, is she sleeps with a married man so that, one, he can't be forced to propose to her, and two, she's no longer a virgin, and because of that, then nobody wants to marry her. So she goes off to London now that she's, you know, ruined her chances of being part of the season, and she happens to run into this old lady. So this old lady is looking for a companion. And so she puts her up because she's starting to run out of money. She doesn't have enough money to live on. And she gives her a free place to live. She has plenty of food and everything else. And they decide that the two of them are going to help solve mysteries, but pretending that they are writing to a man named Sherlock Holmes who doesn't exist. So that was, I mean, it sounds a little hokey. It took like at least, I was going to say, I'm going to say half the novel just to set that up. Um, but once they do, then she starts solving things and she's very likable and clever and she has an adorable sister who wants to help her. And so, um, so yeah, I, I love that book. I don't know if I'll read more only because I'm not that into historical novels, but We'll see. Um, the next book that I read was uh, Krista Davis, A Murder She Barked. And so this is the first in a new mystery series called Paws and Claws. I actually think we're going to read that next month for the Cozy Escape Book Club. So Paws and Claws, I gave five stars. It is your typical beginning where the main character starts out and she's been dumped by her boyfriend. She's been fired by her job. So super cliche. But uh, because of that, she returns back home to the Sugar Maple Inn. And the Sugar Maple Inn is run by her 
grandmother, I believe. And in the meantime, her grandmother has changed it over. So it's like a very pet friendly uh, bed and breakfast. And so she happens to run into this random dog at a gas station. And the gas station dog jumps in her car. She tries to get it to like get out, but it won't get out. So she decides to I guess keep it uh but then she loses the dog later it's very odd I'm like don't you so she loses the dog later she can't find it um and it's just weird I've never lost my dog or anybody's dog when I'm watching them like um I'm not saying I'm perfect but I do like I don't know I just it's crazy to me that when people lose dogs like if my dog ran away like one time the dog ran away I chased it until I found him I didn't go out and I was like oh I guess I can't find Hoppy I guess I'll just go home and put up some signs later when I have time. I don't know. That's why it's crazy to me when people lose a dog and they can't. Like, I would just drop everything. Like, my purse, my car. Like, it doesn't matter. I would go after my dog. But I could just be a crazy person. So, anyways, this was a cute book. So, I'm not going to say any more because I'm, like, pretty sure that's going to be the book of the month club for next month. Um, The next book was A Deadly Inside Scoop by Abby Collette. Uh, and I gave this one a one. And the reason I gave it a one is because it is, uh, it was basically just about this woman. She gets her MBA and she's going to go back home and apply her MBA to her family's ice cream shop, which you don't need an MBA to run an ice cream shop. So it just seemed kind of silly. But also at the same time, she, it felt like there were lots of contrived, um, like closeness things like, oh, my grandfather, I made him scrambled eggs and he looked at me warmly. I don't know. It just kind of felt like fake. Uh, and then at the same time, it's because her grandmother died. She has a medical illness that her grandmother died from too, and it's hereditary. And so they talk about that a lot. So that's like the number one reason I gave this a one, because I feel like the reason I read cozy mysteries is because I don't want to read about depressing things like that. And so when you put that in there, it like brings the whole book down. It makes it a totally different book, um, like a book about cancer or a book about a chronic illness that you're, fatal illness you're dying from or something that's really painful that keeps you in bed. Like all of those things are fine, but I don't want them in my cozy mystery novel. So, um, so that for me, like anytime you put that in a book, it's like a one for me. Um, the next one is Death Al Dente, which is by Leslie Budowitz. So this is about um, Aaron, and she decides to go home to revamp her family's mercantile store. And she wants to make it into a gourmet food market. And so she's throwing this big event, the Festa di Pasta, for it. And at the Festa di Pasta, her old manager, the, uh, the store's old manager, Charlotte, I think, or no, Claudette, is killed. And so it's just kind of weird. Like, she just seems more concerned about, like, keeping the party running and keeping the store reopened than she does about the murder. Like, I get that that's part of the reason you need to have a store or a shop. She needs to have another purpose. But it was just kind of odd. Usually in books, like, or in life or anytime, there's more, like, everything stops. Like, you just, the party's over. People go home. But she, like, just kept serving food and, like, going on with part. It That, to me, just, like, kind of threw me off. Um, but in general, the reason I gave it one star, too, is because I just wasn't interested in the characters or invested in them or like anything else or the shop or things that were going on. So that was, that was that. So I probably won't read any more books uh, in that series. Uh, One Tequila by Tr Tr Patricia, no, just Trisha O'Malley, um, is an Althea Rose mystery. So this mystery is about a psychic and she owns half of a store called the Luna Rose Potions and Tarot Shop. So I gave this book one star because, first of all, it took like 25% of the book just until you get to the murder. And before that, all she does is talk about how perfect her life is, how beautiful her friend is, how gorgeous her friend's shop is, how talented she is. Like, everything is just wonderful. Um, so, and not that that's a bad thing, but it was just kind of boring. And then... Um, Later, there's like cheating in the book. Uh, the police are stupid. They're corrupt. Um, what else? The magic didn't really make a lot of sense. Uh, so yeah, or it wasn't very well explained. So, and again, maybe it's because I'm not like into psychics a lot. Uh, but yeah, so that was <laughs> that book. Um, I think that was it. Those are all the books that I read 
before March. So that was a long list. Um, I will check back in with you guys next week. I honestly, this is a new channel. And well, it's not that new of a channel. It's a new thing I'm doing with the channel, doing more booktube stuff versus author tube stuff. So this is my first ever what I read for the month haul. And I'm looking at the time. It is really long. I don't know. If, I see other people doing like six or seven minutes. And I think that's because they mentioned just a few things. I will try to get like more concise in future videos. But um, I will see you guys next week with I don't know what something about something mystery related. All right. Bye. <laughs>